Hi folks, Canadian Prepper here. So Tesla has just made it fashionable to be a prepper. Let's talk about it. Tesla has now made it fashionable to drive around a semi-armored vehicle, which in times like these is quite the feat. For something like this to come out of Silicon Valley in California, I don't think that in itself is getting enough attention because this is a very militaristic type vehicle. I personally think it reminds me of something out of the movie Total Recall. I know Blade Runner was an inspiration for the truck. The thing we need to keep in mind when people are being critical of a concept like this, and I'm gonna talk about why I actually like it. The reason why all vehicles look the way they have for the last hundred years is because you need a combustion engine in the front. There is nothing inherently sacred about the way current trucks look. It's merely the fact that that's how we're used to them looking. And there's a thing called the mere exposure effect in psychology. The more you're exposed to something, the more you come to like it because the more familiar it is. People don't like uncertainty. So when you see something like this, when it rolls out on its stage, and I was among the millions of people who was like WTF is this. We need to keep in mind that electric vehicles have provided an entirely new platform for utility vehicles. If you look at the way cars were designed, the original trucks from like the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s were really rounded edges. And then you approach the 60s and 70s and 80s where things start to take on that more square type look. And in the 80s, sci-fi shows, all of the future vehicles you know, were projected to have that square, rectangular, polygonal type look. And then if you go into the 90s, things start to round out again. So maybe we're actually going to enter a new era of going back to the rectangular style, you know, straight edge, right angles type vehicles. I don't know, it's, it's hard to say, but it seems like technology goes through those phases. Now, what I really like about this design is that it's purely function over fashion. There's absolutely nothing fashionable and appealing about this truck to the average person. Everything about this vehicle is functional. There's no paint job. There's no sleek, fancy curves. But it has this very polygonal, pyramidal design. And what I like about that is just think about the potential for aftermarket accessories on a very simple platform like this. But it's gonna be so easy to customize and modify this thing. And I'm just amazed at how the whole emphasis here has been on toughness. Now the body of the truck is actually a load bearing cold rolled steel, which is bulletproof to a nine millimeter round, which is incredible. They do a demonstration of them hitting it with a sledgehammer. Apparently they were doing that all night. Uh, they also did a demonstration of these quote unquote armored glass, which actually broke on stage but I did a little bit of digging into that and apparently they had done that test 50 times prior and the windows didn't break. So I'm not sure why the windows broke, but they also did another demonstration where they showed the glass laying flat and they dropped the silver ball bearing on it and it didn't break. So regardless, uh, the glass is still much stronger than the conventional glass used in vehicles. So this whole concept has been built around durability and aggressiveness, which is a total, you know, 180 from what all other Tesla stuff is all about. Now, what I didn't like about the presentation is obviously, you know, Elon Musk comes out in his usual awkward self and gives the very sketchy presentation. I didn't mind that so much. I just felt that they didn't give a lot of details about the interior. They didn't talk about uh, the tires. They didn't talk about the, the safety aspect because if this is cold roll steel all around, how is that gonna work with the standard crumple zones and all of that? They don't really explain any of that. They didn't really talk too much about the, the truck bed cover that slides up and how that works. So there's a lot of unknowns still and maybe you know that's because there's still a lot of uh, details being worked out. But in terms of the basic specifications, $39,000 for the base model, $40,000 for the base model, which nobody's gonna buy because anybody who wants a truck wants four wheel drive and that's only rear wheel drive. Unless you're just using it for work that you're gonna be doing in the city, 
and you don't live in a place where there is winter and snowy roads, you may not need that four-wheel drive. But I'm guessing that only 5% of the vehicles sold are going to be the $40,000. Because even with that, they're not making any money off this vehicle, I can tell you that right now. At least not in the beginning. Now, where they're going to make their money is with the self-driving add-on, which is going to be an extra $10,000. And the thing about that, uh, that is supposed to be one of those features which makes all Tesla vehicles actually an appreciating asset because Tesla, they're always upgrading the software in their vehicles. And every time an update gets included, the self-driving capabilities of the vehicle become more enhanced. So the idea is that at some point it's going to be fully autonomous and fully autonomous vehicles at some point are going to be much more valuable because if you have a car which can, you know, go and work for you while you're at work and, you know, do be an Uber to somebody, then, you know, that's potentially a source of income. So I think that's where they're making their money on this. Now they have two other models, which is the 50,000 and the $70,000 models. And those obviously are going to be higher performance packages. You're, for the $70,000 model, you're going to have a tri-motor, not uh, the quad motor that the Rivian has, but tri-motor. Regardless, you're getting 2.9 seconds to 60 miles an hour. You're getting a 500 mile range, which is really good for a truck like this in particular. You're getting 3,500 pound payload, which is very respectable for a vehicle in this class. I believe the new Ford F-150s are between 2,500 to 3,000 pound payload. So 3,500 is excellent. That's a lot of weight. I mean, if you can load 3,500 pounds up onto this thing, I would be impressed. Uh, you're not gonna do that too often. And it can tow 14,000 pounds, which I believe is the best in its class of truck. So everything about this vehicle is all about function, but they don't tell us about the LED light bar system at the front and on the top. Uh, they don't tell us anything about the tires, or these strange looking hubcaps. They don't really talk much about the interior design and I don't think the interior is finished. They had some sort of marble dashboard on there, which was uh, quite strange looking. So I think there's a lot of unknowns here, but if you want to get one, you can actually reserve it for a hundred bucks, which is refundable if you decide when it eventually does come out that you don't want it. Now here's the thing with electric vehicles for preppers. This is basically a portable generator on wheels. It has 110 volt and 220 volt outputs. I believe it's a 250 kilowatt hour uh, battery pack on the, on the largest size, which is huge. That is massive. That's more than enough to power a home for several days. Uh, and conservatively, if you were just using the bare essentials, you could probably power your life on that for a month if you were to really conserve the electricity. To put that in perspective, that is nearly 220 times the size of a energy Kodiak uh, battery. So that's a lot of power in a vehicle. It's basically a Tesla wall plus on wheels. So you're getting a portable generator. I've had a lot of comments about electromagnetic pulse and blah, blah, blah. Every time I hear somebody talk about how they're not gonna do something because of EMP, I kinda have to roll my eyes a bit. Number one, the possibility of that is very slim. Number two, the possibility, as we've discussed on this channel numerous times before, I've brought on the most prominent expert in the field of studying electromagnetic pulse, Arthur T. Bradley, who's done a three interview series here on the channel, who's basically told people that the hype about EMP destroying vehicles has been overblown. That's not to say it's not a threat, but there are ways to protect against it. You can make your garage into a Faraday cage. The car itself, especially this one, which is gonna be all stainless steel, is going to attenuate the electromagnetic pulse a lot. Anyways, EMP for me is not a good reason not to consider an electric option. People will also say, well, you should just get a diesel because you can make biodiesel. But if you think about the long term, not only is that going to take an immense amounts of labor in a time when you're just barely trying to survive and feed yourself, I highly doubt you're going to have the resources to effectively create biodiesel and get good returns on that investment of labor. I really don't think it's going to be as possible as people think it is. It's possible, but is it going to be, is the juice going to be worth the squeeze? Is the other question now with a passive energy source like solar 
now you're talking. If you can get yourself a 10 kilowatt solar array, which is no doubt a very large investment, and that's probably the bare minimum of what you would need to charge something like this, because if you're talking about a 250 kilowatt hour battery, now that's gonna take you several days to charge off of a 10 kilowatt hour solar system. But the thing is, you're not gonna be driving 500 kilometers a day, especially in the post-apocalyptic wasteland, let's get real. Now the problem with it is, is that if you wanted to be nomadic, uh, in order to be able to carry the amount of solar panels that you would need to reinvigorate this thing, it would be a lot. So recharging by solar is not the most ideal solution, obviously, but it can be done and it can be done passively. The other things to consider are that the car is stealthy, it has insane acceleration, it has a very good range, it is now an armored electric variant, which not only does it have the best performance out of all the trucks, but it is the most robust design. So for all the traditionalists who try to harp on this because it doesn't look like a duck and quack like a duck, all I can say is that you need to think outside the box with this. Because I think that in terms of a preparedness vehicle, it probably doesn't get better than this. Now the catch with Teslas, as I've discussed on this channel before, is that they're recording a lot of your data, okay? And so it's all a part of the global surveillance apparatus and that's just, you know, a pill you have to swallow if you want to indulge in any modern technology, including YouTube or smartphones or whatever. So that's kind of par for the course. But the self-driving feature is another thing, which is going to be incredible in its own right to have that capability. And it's a self-driving feature which works independent of GPS. So even if the grid were to go down, the self-driving feature would still work. Imagine the tactical uh, applications of something like that, or the potential. Obviously it's not refined, but you can bet your bottom dollar that the military will be experimenting with autonomous uh, self-driving functions to assist them in certain operations. The ability to deliver stuff to one place without actually having to put somebody at risk, put somebody in the vehicle. The potential there is just wild. Now the cherry on top is that Tesla also created an electric ATV. I've been looking into electric ATVs and snowmobiles and all that stuff recently, and there are a few on the market. Now, the thing I didn't like is they didn't give us any specs about the ATV. They showed it charging in the back of the truck because you can actually charge the ATV from the truck. Obviously, that's gonna cut down your range of the truck, but you know, whatever. I mean, I'm sure you could spare 100 or 200 miles if you have a 500 mile range. So they're charging the ATV from the truck. They don't talk about the specs of the truck, but that in itself is pretty cool. And the ramp that you use to get up on the truck. Oh, and one of the best features of all was the adaptive air suspension. So, you know, you don't need a lift kit. If you want to increase your aerodynamics and range on the highway, you lower it down. If you want to go off road, you raise it up. So uh, that's just amazing. Uh, they also talk about how the approach angle is 35 degrees and the departure angle is uh, 28 degrees, which is the best in class also. Uh, ground clearance up to 16 inches, which is pretty good. You're not gonna need much more than that. The bed length, or what they're calling the vault, is 6.5 feet. And the interesting thing about the vault's design is that the box is a lot higher in the rear. So there's the side walls, you know, so you have a lot more cubic volume uh, within the truck bed. I think it's 100 feet cubed. Pretty impressive specifications. And I mean, zero to 60 in 2.9 seconds, come on. They show it racing a Porsche 911 and beating it. We're talking about what is essentially an armored personnel carrier here, beating a Porsche 911 in a race. That in itself is phenomenal. Now let's talk about the competition. So there's the Rivian, which is really right now the only contender which is set for a 2020 launch. The Rivian, you know, went with the traditional truck look. And from a marketing standpoint, obviously that's gonna be the better decision. Personally, I don't like the look of the Rivian, especially the front end. 
I feel that it looks like a very soft truck and I know it's very capable. The Rivian to me looks like a very effeminate MMA fighter. I mean, you know he can fight, but you're just unsure, you know, hey, the, your eyes deceive you. It looks like the Dr. Peabody truck or something. The whole overall design of it, I don't find very exciting. It, it wasn't brave enough to break from those conventions that I talked about at the beginning of the video. The reasons why a truck was designed how it was. So what they're catering to is people's memory of how things have always been. Whereas Tesla is trying to think well into the future. And uh, the other thing with the Tesla truck is we don't know what's under the front end because I'm assuming there might be some storage under there because there's not an engine. So, you know, God only knows what's underneath there. Now, the real question is, would I drive one? And the answer to that is pretty simple. <laughs> yes, I drive one. This thing looks totally badass. This thing has Canadian prepper and all American prepper written all over it. it we'll see what it looks like when, the, when it's in the final design phases. Uh, I may well have to trade in my Tundra for this because that thing just looks badass. And in terms of function over fashion, you could not ask for or even design an electric truck that functioned for the purpose of prepping and survivalism as does this truck. Elon Musk is totally out of his mind to do this because his stock pew, dropped the day after. But I mean, the truck was brought out on stage by a bunch of cyberpunks in their post-apocalyptic garb. You know, this whole thing has Mad Max written all over it. So maybe they know something we don't. Anyways, guys, let me know what you think about the Cybertruck in the comment section below. I'm going to post a poll. Do you think that this truck is cool? Do you like it? Do you not like it? Do you like it somewhat? You know, what are your thoughts on it? Let me know below. Thanks for watching. Canadian Prepper out. The best way to support this channel is by gearing up through CanadianPreparedness.com. We got high quality gear, and I mean high quality gear only. There are free shipping options, and my subscribers get an exclusive discount of 10% off. Use coupon code SURVIVALPREPPER in all caps, one word, at the checkout. Thanks for your support.